Okay, now for the next part of this class, we want to take a look at another aspect of team life that, uh, or body life that many people don't like to talk about or they don't like to address it. Um, but I do, I will, okay? Um, we find this, uh, we want to stay here in Acts chapter 13 and verse 5. Uh, actually, verse 4. And they, uh, that would be Barnabas and Saul, being sent forth by the Holy Spirit, departed from Seleucia, and from there they sailed unto Cyprus. And when they had come to Salamis, they, they, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They had also John, also John to their ministry. Um, this would be in chapter 12, verse 25, John Mark. This would be the nephew of Peter and the nephew of Barnabas. Okay, John Mark. He was young. And actually, this is the same same man that wrote the Gospel of Mark. Uh, the Gospel of Mark was written by John Mark. He was the nephew of Peter. And actually, uh, in the Gospels class, how many here have taken Gospels? Yeah, in the Gospels class, it's really not the Gospel according to Mark. It's the Gospel according to Peter. Peter uh, spoke it and John Mark is the one who wrote it down. Okay, so it was, it's, you know, and although John Mark wrote it down, it's actually Peter's gospel. Um, so we have John Mark here, and then we know what happens when they come down through. Here's the other idea of what we were talking about a little bit earlier. You have the persecution or the stress from the outside. Now you have the persecution or the stress. It is more like it, the stress from the inside. Okay? And we find here in verse 13, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they sailed unto per, uh, Perga and to Pamphylia, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. Okay? Now, if you read what happened between verses... 6 and 12, uh, the idea of the Elimaeus, the sorcerer, took place. And this was a thing that um, it really offended, really offended uh, John Mark. Being young, first of all, the Holy Spirit never said to John Mark that he should go. The Holy Spirit said, said unto me, Paul and Barnabas. Um, so on, uh, in, in, in the team or in the body that is being sent, there are times when people will join that team to go overseas and they were never supposed to be there to begin with. You're going to have that. Uh, let's, let, let me rephrase it this way. Have any of you ever found yourselves in a place where you were never supposed to be? Yeah, uh, come on now. <laughs> well, is the camera facing the other direction? <laughs> yeah, we all, all of us have found ourselves in that. And I was like, I shouldn't even be here. You know, you, you heard from God and you went anyways because of sentimentality. You went because that was what the schedule said to do. You went for whatever reason. You went just because you wanted to go. You wanted to do something different, excitement. Okay, you had nothing better to do. You went because of sin. Okay, it was a number of different reasons why you ended up in a place you never should have been. And now what happens when you go overseas and you find yourself in a place where you never should have been? Leave. Don't try to stick it out. If God didn't call you somewhere, don't try to stick it out. John Mark did the right thing here. Everybody gives him a bad rap, okay? But the Holy Spirit never called him to go. 
And when he came to a place where there was warfare here uh, uh, on the island of Paphos, when there was warfare that took place, he had no grace to deal with that warfare because he wasn't supposed to be there to begin with. And so what did he do? He returned to Jerusalem, which was perfectly fine. I'll say it this way. If it wasn't okay for him to leave, if you leave Baltimore, you should never return. As, you know, or someone, I don't know, I'm going to go try and see. What happens if someone goes out on the mission field, whether it's in the States or overseas, uh, they go out and they try to plan a work. And it doesn't, by sight, doesn't succeed. There's no church that's planted, and they return to Baltimore. People see them as a failure? No. I don't think so, because I don't think the purpose in going is not to plant a church. The purpose in going is get to know God. Now, in the process of getting to know God, if we can plant a church, awesome. But what ha if my purpose is only if my purpose of going is to plant a church, then what happens? I become afraid of returning without planting a church because I'm afraid of what other people will think. What will I be like in their eyes? They'll never send me out again. I'm a failure. I didn't succeed. No, not at all. If my purpose was to get to know God, it doesn't matter if a church was planted or not. What if God wanted you to go to a... How about this one? There was not one disciple that come from the city of Nan, but Jesus went there. Only one time in his whole ministry, he went to the city of Nan. And you know what he did? He raised a man from the dead. Remember the woman was weeping? Her husband had died, and now her son was dead and had no one to take care of him, take care of her. And Jesus raised, the son, raised her son from the dead. He, like, he went like 25 miles out of his way to go to that village just for her. What if God has called you or has purposed in your heart to bring you to a place to evangelize so that one person could get saved. And then you move on. And that person never joins the ministry. You have no idea. It won't be revealed until you get to heaven. Well, I was such a failure. Nothing happened. One soul. <laughs> Hello? One. Uh, how, many, how, how many souls does it take for all the angels to rejoice in heaven? One. Our purpose is not, it, Jesus didn't say, what did he say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And don't come back until you've won 30. No, just go preach. Doesn't matter what the results, let the results be up to God. Just go preach. And so what happens, people have this concept, uh, I have to be successful, I have to have so many uh, disciples. I have, to have, I have to be able to send missionaries onto the field from my local assembly before I can return from the mission field. And, it's like, and, and they get into this comparison. It is, a, it is very unwise to compare yourselves among yourselves. I learned this a long time ago. I cannot be Pastor Shabelli. I don't even try to be. Because I can't. I'm not him. And so what happens is uh, the biggest thing, the biggest mistake we can make as disciples is trying to be like our discipler. We need to be like Christ. The, the greatest way to disciple people is to disciple them to be like Christ, not like yourself. John Mark was young, yes. John Mark saw a lot in the ministry, yes. John Mark went to the mission field and failed. He left. No, I don't think so at all. Because we know that John Mark was very useful in the ministry later on, even to the point, it was at 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, where Paul... 
is ready to what he figures is going to be his last couple of days on earth. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Paul says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. He is profitable to me. He is an encouragement to me. Bring John Mark, the man who left me when I was on the mission field. Bring him to me. I'm still on the mission field, and he's still part of my team. He's still part of the body. Bring him to me. He's profit. He has a, and the word profitable there, he has a ministry to me. That's what Paul is saying. Bring John Mark. He has a ministry to me. And now what happened? When I went on the mission field, uh, when I went on the mission field, I had someone ask me one time, they said, what, why are you going on the mission field? I said, well, you know, Pastor Shabelli asked me to teach in a Bible college there and to head up the youth ministry. And, you know, I don't know, evangelize, win the lost. And they're like, no, no, well, what is the purpose of going on the mission field? Like, to uh, head up the youth ministry, to teach in a Bible college. No, no, no. What's your purpose? Why are you going? Like, man, this guy's deaf. Um, to win the lost, to <laughs> disciple people, young teenagers, you know. <laughs> you know it's like, it, I, I didn't get it. It was like three years later, I was sitting there studying the scriptures one night, and I realized it's not what you do, it's who you are getting to know. What's your purpose for going, either short-term or long-term, on the mission field? It's not to do anything. It's, get, it's to get to know God. It's to let Him teach you. Let Him do everything. Just simply receive from Him. And so what happens, John Mark was at a point where he, he came to this place where he was able to receive from God, and he actually had a ministry now to Paul. Um, Pastor Shabelli and I decided we were going to go to East Africa. And we, uh, we met in London one year. We flew to Uganda. We evangelized in Uganda for all day long. We, we start like 8 o'clock in the morning and we'd finish like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, all day long. And we had a huge duffel bag full of tapes and tracks. And we'd just stand there in front of the Caltex petrol station and just pass out tracks all day long. And then, you know, if you, you know, if you can get a conversation going with people, you'd have a little rap session going on. And one day we were, we were doing this, and I had a group of people, and he had a group of people, and he tapped me on the shoulder. He's like, are you ready? I was like, Okay, right or left? He goes, to the left. Right, left. Okay, to the left. He said, on three. Okay, one, two, three. And I turned around, and I was facing his people, and he was facing my people. And it was like a whole brand new rap session all over again. And it just started, start, who's got a question? You just start, people were like looking at us like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I just asked a question. I'm sorry, I missed it. What was it? You know? <laughs> and he just had a rap session right on the street. And then we got on a boat. And we took a boat across Lake Victoria and went to Tanzania. And that, and that was the night that the typhoon came off the ocean onto Lake Victoria and like hundreds of people uh, drowned and died in Lake Victoria that night. And we didn't know. We just thought it was a very rough boat ride. And uh, Pastor Billy promised, I am not taking that boat back. I am flying back. I hate boats. We took the boat back. And uh, in Tanzania, we evangelized in Tanzania. We came back to Uganda. And we, we had a prayer meeting. We were, for a year, we prayed in Baltimore. And uh, Pastor Billy said, I really believe God's leading me to Ethiopia. I was like, Ethiopia? And we had an Ethiopian family in the, in the, in the church at that time. I was like, I, I've been praying. <laughs> God's not leading me to Ethiopia at all. He's leading me. I believe it's Uganda. <clears throat> so we continued praying. He said, well, 
I, I believe God's leading us to Ethiopia. And I said, well, let's do this. I, I, I can't go right away. I need another six months to nine months to get everything in order. You're the team leader. I'll trust your leading from God. You go to Ethiopia. I'll meet you there. He said, okay. And he, he left in like September. Okay, or late, late September, he ended up leaving. And uh, he wasn't there for like one and a half weeks. And I got a phone call like two o'clock in the morning. He said, don't come to Ethiopia. I'll meet me in Uganda. I'm like, okay, good deal. <laughs> I'll meet you in Uganda. <laughs> and uh, now, what, was it wrong for him to go to Ethiopia? No, not at all, because that's where God led him. But God led him there to, and he, as, in his words, God led him there to show him that wasn't the place. I was led to Uganda. And so what happened is, uh, as when he went to Uganda, I was led to Uganda. I came under him as my pastor there, and it was in perfect order. When you are led by God, God will put everything in order. Okay? And so what happens is, uh, John Mark came to a place where he realized, this is not the place for me. I'm out of place. I'm not supposed to be with Paul and Barnabas on the mission field. And you know what? I'm leaving. Now, that may have upset Paul, and it may even have upset his uncle, Bar un uncle Barney. Okay? And so what happens? Too bad. Too bad. One thing in serving God is you can't be sentimental. Don't be sentimental. When God leads you, now, I'm not saying go against authority. I'm not saying be rebellious or anything like that. I'm not saying that. But I am saying this. You need to hear from God and be led by God. And when it comes time to leave the mission field, leave. Because if you don't, you will find yourself on the mission field without grace. God will shut off all that you... Like when I lived in Ghana... It was 120 degrees and 100% humidity. And it was like, it was brutal. And you know what? I, it never bothered me. I was like, this is, everybody was like, oh, it's so hot here. I'm like, this is awesome. I love it. I remember going eight months, not one drop of rain for eight months one year. Not one drop of rain. I didn't care. I was like, this is awesome. I lived in a, in a slum of a shama outside of the, the city of Tama, and it was like, I thought it was the greatest place in the world. And then years later, I went back to visit Ghana. After I, God, I left Ghana, years later, I went back to visit, and I'm thinking, oh my God, it's so hot here. Who would ever want to live in this place? Look how dirty it is. And I was like, wait a minute, I lived here. What am I saying? God gave me grace to live there. God gave me grace for the weather. God gave me grace for the people. God gave me grace for the food. God gave me grace for the mosquitoes. God gave me grace for the taxis. Everything. I mean, at the time when we lived in Ghana, there was no outside communication. Nobody had cell phones. There was no such thing as internet. Okay, maybe there was, but nobody knew about it. Maybe Al Gore is the only one. But, uh, you know, it's like, it, nobody knew. <laughs> you like that one? <laughs> you know, no, we, we had one phone, public phone, at the post office. And we had to wait in line for a phone call to come from the United States. And I remember, we would pick up, you know, the phone would ring, and you'd pick it up. Is there an Asante here? Ah, here. Oh, it's for you. And however long it took him to talk on the phone, he'd hang up and everybody would be sitting there staring at the phone, waiting for it to ring. Who's the next call for? And I remember one time we, in Uganda, it, this was the case, and Pastor Roy goes, I, I know they're calling. I have an important call. And the phone rang, and he picked it up. And when he picked it up, he hung up. He was like, hello? And he made up a name, this weird name. He was like, is there any, whatever name it was. And he's, he's got the phone hung up. Is there, are they here? Are they here? No? And all of a sudden, the phone started ringing. He goes, oh, hello? <laughs> all the people started yelling at him because they realized he would have hung up the phone. <laughs> but it was for him, so he was like, just shut the door. <laughs> He's got his foot up against it, talking to the people. <laughs> uh, but, we, we hadn't, but God gave us grace for those things. 
He gave us grace for it. You will find yourself as like, this is the way it is in this country. We have no problem with it. It's fine. God gives you grace for it. When God talks to you, tells you, communicates to you that it's time to leave, He will begin to shut the grace off. You will find yourself becoming very frustrated, not with just yourself and not just with the people around you, you will become very frustrated with God also because you're not obeying Him. You're not listening to Him. I, when, when God said to go in Ghana, I remember God, when God told Pastor Bradley to go, I had already been gone. Uh, God started removing people from the team one by one. Couple by couple, God started removing the team. First it was a visa situation. Then it was a sickness. Then it was somebody's uh, parents, I think, they had to go take care of. And somebody had to return because of a tax thing. And somebody had no money, they had to return. It was like somebody decided to go to a secular school, another college. You know? So one by one, God started removing people from the team. And Pastor Shabelli and his family were left. And I remember him calling me and saying, God told me to leave. And I'm saying, ah. I said, so... What, were you going to wait like wait till convention and come back? or uh, In a year, are you going to come back? He goes, no. Uh, can you pick me up at the airport tomorrow? I was like, this was it. Uh, God told him to leave. He, he called in the leaders of the church and says, you're teaching this class, you're teaching this class, you're teaching this class, you're the pastor of the church. Love you guys, I'll see you in a year. And that's what he did. He, went, he obeyed immediately. And you know what? It was the best thing, too. Because right in the middle of the semester, nobody could sit there and think about Pastor Shabelli leaving. All they had to do, they, they carried on the work even though we weren't there. And it grew. It did very well. Because you know why? If you don't obey God, what ends up happening? God has to move you. If you don't move when God speaks, God, right back to chapter 9, verse 1. It's a full circle. If you don't move when God tells you to go, God will move you. And sometimes, uh, you know what? The moving isn't so well. Just ask Jonah. It's like, move. Now, I'm going to go this way. Okay, have it your way. You ready to move out of, the, out of the fish? Yeah, good. Guess what? You moved right to the place where I wanted you to be. You know, it's like God has his way of doing this. Isn't, it, isn't that why each one of us are in Bible school? When God said to move, go to Bible school, guess what? You had to obey. Because you find yourself here sooner or later, one way or the other. And I remember, I remember when I got out of secondary, when I got out of high school, and uh, God spoke to me about going to Bible college. I came, I went, I moved, I went to convention. I figured, well, I'll go to convention. I'll go back. I'll work for the summer, make some money. Man, that was the worst mistake I made. I should have just stayed in Lenox from convention. Because I wasted so much gas money going the whole way back to Ohio. And that's all it was, was a war with my family while I was there. And I remember, that's it, I'm out of here. Packed up everything I owned. Two pair of jeans, and sneakers, basketball shorts, and a couple t-shirts, and threw them in a the car, and that's it, I'm gone. And I moved to Lenox. And I remember, I pulled in a parking lot, and I looked at Lewis Hall, and I says, you told me to come, I'm here. He said, well, we don't really have any beds for you. I said, fine, I'm here. And I remember Pastor Stevens walking by one day, Karis Hall, and I was sleeping in my car. I was actually parked in his parking spot. I didn't know it. And he come walking by, and I'm like, <laughs> and he beats on the door, on the window. I was like, oh, hi, Pastor. He goes, what are you doing? I says, sleeping. <laughs> he goes, here as well? Lewis Hall said they had no beds. He just looked at me. It was amazing. That night I had a bed. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Now, I happen to, it happened to be Frank Moorhead's. He was on a mission field in India for two weeks, so I took his bed for two weeks. It was great. What happens? Don't become sentimental. I can stick this out. You know why? You'll be very frustrated. Now, if God has called you and it's difficult, stick it out. 
don't quit. Now remember this, the gift and the call of God is without God changing his mind. So either God called you or God didn't call you. So John Mark came to a place where he realized God did not call me onto the mission field with Uncle Barney and Paul. So what did he do? He left. And it was perfectly okay. So when you see people returning from the mission field, don't try to evaluate your, why are they returning? They're coming back so soon. Oh my gosh, they're returning and there's actually no church there. They failed. That's, none of that is important. Obedience to God is what is important. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Being obedient to God. And so what happens? You can't be sentimental with your parents. Are you, are you going on the mission field? Are you going to come back for Christmas? <laughs> Mom, there's always a Christmas every year. I might miss a few. But I will make some, hopefully. Okay? It's like you can't come back for everybody's funeral. Okay? I'll see you in heaven. Love you. Sorry. Okay? I wish I could say I'd light a candle for you, but I don't believe in that either, so not going to do it. All right? So what happens? I, when I go to the mission, God called me to the mission field, I have to put all the rest of that stuff behind me. Now, do you miss out on a lot of things? Yeah, you do. You miss a lot of Super Bowls. You, you miss, you know, it's like you come back, you, you come back for the summer for a convention, and it's like you feel like you're like two or three years behind everybody. Like you have no idea what's modern, what's, you know, it's like, I remember coming back one year, I said, like, hey, you guys going to go to the youth meeting tonight? And they're like, youth meeting? We're in Bible college now. I was like, oh. Sorry. <laughs> when I left, you were like, you know, teenagers. Well, we're still teenagers, 19, but we're in Bible college now. We don't do those things anymore. Oh, okay. You know, it's like uh, everybody seems to move along, and you seem to be walking in wet cement. You know, it's like just plodding along. Uh, team life, it's body life. It's enjoyment. It's fun. It's operating together as a unit. When you do, man, uh, unit in unity, when you do, God cannot help but to command a blessing. Right? Is it Psalm 133? Right? God commands a blessing when there's unity. Doesn't mean everybody has to live in the same house. Okay? Now, uh, we were talking during the break. You get a bunch of guys together and a bunch of single guys want to live together in a house? I think that's awesome. That's great. Uh, the women on the mission field, the, you know, a bunch of uh, single women want to live together. That's fine. I, you know, uh, make sure you uh, you have a place that's safe. I mean, that, that to me, that's key. That's important. And as a team leader, that's something that needs to be uh, taken care of. You know, but to have everybody, you know, single people, men, women, uh, married couples, everybody living in the same house, that becomes a recipe for disaster. It may need to be for the first six months or a year until you get established and get to understand what's going on in that country. But you, to go much more than that becomes very dangerous. But what happens is um, the key to it is, is hearing from God, evangelizing the lost, bringing believers into the church, discipling them, training them up. You're actually working yourself out of a job. You're trying to come to a place where they are doing what you do so that you could just step off the scene, they take over, and you could just disappear. Go somewhere else and start all over again. And, once, uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that really lacks in Christianity today is pioneering, experienced pioneering church planters. It's something that is a rarity in Christianity today. Experienced, pioneering church planters. And so, um, yeah, we just see, see this principle here throughout the book of Acts, how it was done. And I, and I think that's how a unit, how a body works together. A local assembly here, 
a local assembly here, a local assembly here, a body and a unit working together. Yeah, we're all one in Christ. But at the same time, you are going to have people that will leave the mission field. Uh, some people will leave the mission field because of no finances. Some people will leave the mission field for health. Other people will leave the mission field because they're moving, they're doing, they're going on with God in another area of their life. You know, and so this is what we want to, when you're going to the mission field, we ask all the time, are you, do you want to go short term, long term? How long do you plan to go? Uh, what's the purpose of going? We, we go over all these things, okay? We encourage it. We want people to go. Uh, just don't be like a John Mark and go uh, without being called. And if you do, if you find yourself out there and you realize this isn't what, it, it, what, uh, what it, either I bargained for, it isn't what it's supposed to be, don't die out there. Get back to the place of safety. Come back to the, he went back to the church in Jerusalem where he knew he could be ministered to so that later on he could have a ministry. Okay? Every single one of us has a ministry. And when I went on, when I went to Ghana, my ministry, I knew my ministry was to Pastor Shabelli. Whatever he needed, as he, uh, I, I didn't care about being an assistant in a church, I wanted to be a practical, uh, be used by God to practically minister to him. So when we would travel, uh, yeah, make sure he got food, good food to eat. Make sure, you know, he had coffee when he wanted it. You know, drive the vehicle. Make sure the vehicle was updated, you know, with the, all the inspections and the plates and everything. All the practical little things that he didn't have to worry about. He could concentrate, give himself wholly to prayer and the ministry of the Word. There, you know how you want to, uh, this is what um, uh, Moses, uh, Joshua, this is what Joshua did for Moses. Okay? This, uh, this, this is what most, uh, uh, um, most pastors need someone that will take care of practical details for them. They don't have to worry about it. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to worry about the, you know, yeah, let's go here. Oh, yeah, do we have fuel in the vehicle? You know, it would be like we, all the practical things are all taken care of. And that's what, uh, that's what Barnabas actually did for Paul. And, and it turned out that's what Luke did for Paul. Luke was a doctor, took care of his physical needs. Uh, Luke is the one who wrote these things down, kept a log of what they did, what happened. Okay, Everyone needs this kind of, and that, that is the best training you can get on the mission field. Now, uh, uh, the best training is to be under someone, watch the way they do it, and, and, and learn from experience. There were many times uh, driving Pastor Chevelli's vehicle, I would rather not have been in that vehicle. Some of the conversations that took place, some of the things that had to be dealt with, some of the things that were delegated, you'd be like, I don't really want to be here right now. you like, close my ears and close, I, I tried to close my eyes once, but he yelled at me, almost ran into something. You know, it's like, uh, keep your eyes open, close your ears and close your mouth. But the purpose for being there was training and experience. Like you saw the way he handled a situation with a person. Years later, guess what? The situation arises again with somebody else. I was like, wow, I know how to handle the situation. I saw the way Pastor Shabelli did. I know how to handle the situation. I saw what Pastor Schaller did. I know how to answer this question. I heard Pastor Stevens answer this question before. And you know, it's practical experience. And so as a young, uh, young man, young woman, when you go on the mission field, uh, it is. It, oftentimes, it's just... Mouth closed, eyes and ears open. Just soak it in. Receive it. Hear from God. Obey God. And you know what happens? He ends up, use, he will use you in that ministry later on when you don't even realize it. You have the words to say at that point. You know what to do in that place. And that's how a, that's how a team, a unit operates. Okay? Father, thank you God for... Our call to this ministry, God, thank you for the opportunity to, of sharing the gospel, the word of God, to teach people, to train people, to raise up disciples, to plant churches. 
God, we pray that you would continue to use this church, use this ministry to send out missionaries, to send out church planters into countries, God, where we, we have never been yet, God. We think of just different countries. We think of Burma and Laos, God, two places that are ready for us, God, Indonesia, Malawi. Botswana. God, we pray for th- this, uh, all these summer harvest trips that are coming up, different places. God, send forth laborers into the harvest field. Raise up missionaries. Teach us and train us, God. God, we just thank you and we love you. Just bless us tonight. In Christ's name, amen.